So we're in this series, though, that we're calling Beautiful Deception. The, the devil, one of his titles of the enemy, the devil, is the father of lies. And that's really one of his main tactics of how he um, works in our life is through deception. He is cunning and deceitful and scheming. And, and the, the Bible has a lot of different words, what, the wiles of the enemy, the wiles of the devil. And so uh, this series, we're going to do a short three-week series, and it's going to be focused on these beautiful deceptions, meaning that it's, it's not like in your face, outright evil or wrong a lot of times. A lot of the ways that the enemy trips most of us up is with beautiful deceptions where it looks right. It may feel good. It may even sound good or right, but it, in the end, it's just a beautiful deception, a plan and a scheme of the enemy. And so we're going to talk about this for the next three weeks. Let me jump to 2 Corinthians in your notes or up here, right here on the TV, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. The apostle Paul talking to the Corinthian church now, and he's afraid. Uh, he says, though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. So look, check this out. The, the, God has given you weapons to engage in this battle. And, in, in, and we're going to be talking about today and throughout the series, I'm going to explain to you the very specific weapons that God has given us to actually engage in this warfare and defeat the enemy. And there are specific weapons. And, and by the way, there, there are weapons that I believe that many people are using that are not the, not the right weapons. And they're, they're, we're engaged in the wrong battle with the wrong weapons, you guys. But it says, hey, we're living in the world, but we have weapons the weapons that we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish not like earthly things, but strongholds. And that word there, a lot of times when you're reading your Bible and you're studying your Bible, it's really helpful if you can get to the original language sometimes of that word that you're studying. And this is one of those words that just come a lot more alive when you look at the original language. In your Greek New Testament, or your New Testament was written in, in Greek. That's the original language there. And, and the Greek is very, it's really cool because there's, there's four times as many words in the Greek vocabulary than there is in the English vocabulary. So when you look at these words that were used, you can get a lot more of the meaning, the depth of what uh, the, the Apostle Paul in this instance or the Holy Spirit inspired through the Apostle Paul is trying to say. So when you look at strongholds, the Greek word for that word that was used, just simply translated strongholds, is this word, ohuruma. And it looks, I, I know, it looks like huchimama. <laughs> but that's a different stronghold altogether, you guys. <laughs> Some of you know what I'm talking about too, the stronghold of the hoochie hooch. You know what I mean? <laughs> You better watch out. That hoochie will get you, okay? <laughs> Ahuruma. It means this. It means a prisoner locked by deception. That's what it means, a stronghold. It means there's something that has a strong hold on us, like we're bound, we're captive, we're held by something. It has a strong hold. Really, uh, it means a prisoner locked by deception or living our life by something that isn't true. So it was something that maybe looked true. It even felt good or felt right. But when I bought into it, I was deceived. I was, I was lied to. I'm living, now I'm living my life by something that isn't even true. And so we're going to look at these different beautiful deceptions. And we're going to come right you know, out of the gates with the biggest one here, really the main deception, I think. Um, write it down, you guys, in your notes is this one here, that Satan doesn't exist. That's, that is, I think, one of the biggest uh, deceptions of our culture today is that Satan doesn't exist. And so, so depending on what your faith is and what your background is, or even just what your, what your belief is, you may stand at a few different places on this. Let me say this as well. You may biblically believe Satan exists, but your lifestyle does not show it. Okay? Because some people believe that Satan, whether by their belief or their lifestyle, the way they're living their life, they, they believe that Satan is like an abstract evil, not really a person with a personality, with a scheme and a plan. <laughs> no, but he's like 
He's e- like evil, just evil. That's, that's kind of what Satan is personified as, the evil things, the bad things, the wrong things. And so there's this, this thought that it's, he's not really a person. It's just the evil in the world, okay? And then there's this other, there's an, there's an extreme thought of that some people have that Satan is powerless. And this is where I see a lot of Christians do sometimes. They, they oh, Satan, pff, whatever, he ain't got nothing on me, you know. And, and look, I get it. You need to understand this, that, that Satan is a defeated foe in Christ. Okay, what Jesus did on the cross and, and when he was buried and raised from the grave, he defeated death, hell, and Satan in one swift blow, okay? And, and, and one day, his victory will be complete, And the only way, though, that the enemy can defeat us is if we are unaware of his schemes. That's the only way. He is defeated, but I think we're living as if he's powerless. We're living as if he's really not involved in the affairs of this world or, you know, even the affairs of my life. No, no. But then there's this other extreme as well, that Satan is like everywhere behind everything. Like every bush, the, the devil did it. You know what I mean? You ever know those people? Like the devil did it and he's behind everything. When we used to live on the East Coast for a season, there was this one lady who, I mean, she thought the devil was, the devil was, she rebuked the devil out of everything, okay? Anytime there was a problem, it was the devil. And she rebuking, she'd have car troubles all the time. And she rebuked the, 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 the car for being possessed because she got a flat tire, Okay, I mean, you know, that that's an extreme. That's not where he's at, okay? Neither is this quite right either, that he is powerless, okay? No, no, he does have power. He is, he is scheming, he's cunning, he's, he's all these things. He exists, he does. Now, how do we become aware, though, in order to engage in this battle more appropriately? That's what we're gonna talk about today. In the Bible, it talks about, they call him Satan or the devil or Lucifer is, is a name that 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 comes up. Let me give you a few scriptures that actually refer to Satan just to kind of set the record straight that he's a real, you know, person. He's, he's a, he is, Satan is real. You guys, he exists. Second Corinthians chapter 11 says this, Paul talking to the Corinthians again, and this is where he's afraid here. He says, but I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, that your thoughts would be. So he's talking to the church here, the apostle Paul, and it was something about the way that the church was conducting themselves or not conducting themselves the way that they were posturing themselves in life or believing, he said, man, hey, church, I'm afraid for you. I see something. There's something like the way that you're living your life, it just makes me afraid that you're susceptible. Do you not, are you not aware that there's an enemy of your soul? Like, I'm afraid for you that, that just as Eve was deceived by this cunning serpent, this devil, man, the guys, I'm afraid for you, that your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Like I'm a, Luke chapter uh, 10, verse 18, Jesus himself said, I saw, so this is Jesus saying he saw in heaven Satan fall like lightning. All right, this is now Jesus pre-incarnate, the son of God. He is the eternal one. So he's in heaven and he's talking about an instance that's recorded in Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, different parts of the Old Testament talk about this. And we're not going to get into studying this. I just want to set the stage for this person who we are at war with so that you can see it. Before Satan was Satan, he was actually called Lucifer. And his name in Hebrew is Hillel. It means brightness or the bright one. And that's why he's called the son of the morning star, things like that. He was in charge of like the worship and there was, he was created with so much glory about him. He was a created angel. Lucifer was his name. But the Bible tells us in the Old Testament, some of those verses, tells us that pride was found in his heart. And he wanted to be worshiped and adored as God was worshiped and adored. He, he wanted to be served. And God saw that in his heart, that pride come in his heart. And, and, and so this is the instance that Jesus is talking about when Satan was cast out of heaven and he's, he describes it, because when we picture this like event in heaven, because we watch a lot of movies. How many of you guys like like action movies, epic movies? Anyone, anyone, anyone? Lion, come on now, I like, come on. So we picture a movie scene, so we're like, okay, it's the epic battle of good, cosmic battle of good versus evil. And so we picture evil and good, and they're going at each other, and devil's forces are winning, and then God's forces come back, and then the devil, but then last minute, it looks like the devil's gonna win, and that's like, oh, God wins, and oh, goodness, just made it. You know, that's not the battle at all. This is, Jesus described it with this word. It was like 
lightning. That's what, meaning he said it was as soon as, as soon as God decided to deal with it, bam, it was over like that. That's it. That's all it took was for a word, a thought to be spoken and the devil was cast out. Okay. Revelation chapter 12, verse nine says the great dragon was hurled down. Another revelation talks about him as a dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. And we're living like he doesn't exist or he doesn't have power or he's not involved in the affairs of life. Can I tell you something? He is involved in the affairs of our life. He was hurled down where? To earth. See, this is his playground. Now, this is where he is. And his angels with him. We're told in the Old Testament that a third of the angels actually followed Satan and were cast down to hell with him. They are actually the demonic forces of evil at work today. Okay, so look, if, Satan, if the Bible is full of, these, of this, the reality, Satan does exist, why do we live like he's not after us? Why do we live like he's not real? Why are, we, why are we living not aware of his schemes that he's trying to lead the whole world astray? He's trying to lead you astray, church. And the reason why we're not aware is because he's a master of disguises. He doesn't come at us the way we think he comes at us. He doesn't, he is a, ma let me give you three of the disguises, three ways that the devil, the Satan disguises himself that we just need to be aware of. Here they are in your notes. Number one, that Satan disguises his appearance. You talk about Satan and what comes up, you know, in your mind is probably the Halloween costume, the red jumpsuit, right? You know what I mean? The horns, the tail, the little pitchforks, maybe a tongue that has like a snake tongue, like he's going to come. That's not the way the devil's coming at you at all. He doesn't look like that. That's the wrong picture of who he is. This is what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. It says even Satan, what does he do? He disguises himself as, this is scary, an angel of light. Meaning he, he's going to, what he is, his message is going to sound good. It's, he's going to appeal to your good nature, to your good conscience. This is good for you. This is, this, and he does it all the time. Oh, you need someone in your life, don't you? Go ahead. Go ahead. Take that. Go ahead. Have that. Don't, isn't that good? Isn't, isn't what, aren't you supposed to be successful? Go for it. Get that. Go, and he'll appeal to your good, to your, to a, something good. Now he won't come at you with a pitchfork. No, that's why he's so cunning, is he comes at you as an angel of light. And even his servants, the third of his angels that followed him, they come disguised as servants of righteousness. So they disguise their appearance. And it's like a mirage. A mirage, you know a mirage isn't a, a, a hallucination. It's, it's, you can actually take a picture of a mirage. It's real. It's a real, it's a real thing. It's actually what's called refracted light. It is an inferior picture of a superior source. So a mirage is actually, it's refracted light of the heavens or the skies, the blue sky refracting its light on the sand of the desert. And this is exactly what the enemy does. This is what Satan does. He's a master of disguises. He uses something that is inferior to entice us. Like someone who's lost in the desert dehydrated, dying of, of thirst. We're more susceptible to the enemy's traps and his, his schemes when we're, when we're weak. And he'll come disguised in your weak moments. He'll disguise his appearance as your, as your source of water, your rescue, to meet your need in some way. That's why Paul said, it's so important, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith, not by what? Not by sight. Listen, you, we live this life and we're going about our day and our decisions and our work and our career and our relationships and we're just all sensory. And if you continue to live by your senses, then you will continue to fall prey to his schemes. We walk by faith. You have to walk by faith, not by sight. And if we don't recognize the enemy, it's easy to fall prey to this next disguise. And that is that Satan disguises his intentions. He disguises it. He's not straightforward. He doesn't straightforward tell you. I wish he did. I wish that was like he was. It wouldn't be deceiving, though, if he did. Don't you wish the enemy would just come and let us know the price? Satan promises pleasure, but he doesn't mention the pain, does he? He's been doing it from the beginning. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He actually, when he deceived in the, in the Garden of Eden, when he deceived Eve, he didn't come at her straight by saying, listen, Eve, God's a liar. 
God ain't telling you the truth. No, he doesn't do that. He doesn't come at you straight. What he does is deposits a seat of doubt with a question. Is it true? Is it really true that God said, if you eat of the fruit, you'll die? He just deposits some doubt. Is it, is it really true that aren't you supposed to be happy? Does, doesn't God want you to be with someone? Doesn't God want you to be successful? Doesn't God? And he'll deposit a seed of doubt inside of your heart, inside of your mind to put some question there. Satan is plotting, he's planning, he's looking for ways to deceive. It continues in verse six. It says, when the woman saw that the fruit was good for food, meaning, oh, it's good. He appealed to something that was good for her, food. And it was pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom. So he took some and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her. And then he ate it. His intention is to harm and destroy. Any, any amount of pleasure or happiness that, that he brings will, is, is temporary, is fleeting, is ultimately going to be our ruin. Look what 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says about Satan. It says, Satan, who is the, check this out, the God of this world. Now, that's a lowercase g. He's not the God. He's not the big G. He's the little g. You know what I mean? Okay. He's the little g God of this world. All right. I Meaning he's, and then we're living our life though, like he's not present influencing culture and society. In Daniel chapter 10, we're actually told that these heavenly forces of evil and good are actually at war over the government and affairs of the globe, that they are influencing the world, this God of this world, and we're living like he ain't influencing us and our decisions. You better believe, you guys, the devil is real. Satan is real. And he's at your job. And he's on your TV. And he's on that music. He's there. He's real. He's the God of this world. And, and hey, don't be afraid. Don't be extreme like, oh my gosh, he's all powerful. No, don't, be a, don't follow that extreme, Okay. The only way that he's going to win is if you're not aware of who he is and his schemes. He's the God of this world, and he's blinded the minds of those who don't believe. I think he's blinded a lot of people of even who do believe today. They're unable to see the glorious light of the good news. The, the, it says they don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. So the devil, yes, he has power and he has authority. I, want, I can't stress enough, you guys, that, that God's, listen, God's power trumps the devil's power every day, okay? And you need, you need to recognize that, but we need to also be aware of his schemes. Leads us to the third disguise. Here's the third one. Satan disguises his traps. All right, it wouldn't be a trap if it, was, if it wasn't disguised. It's, look what John chapter 10, verse 10 says. Jesus says about this thief, Satan, the thief's purpose, that's Satan, Satan's purpose is to do what? Steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, hey, but my purpose is to give you a rich and satisfying life. That's my purpose for your life. Now check it out. I want you to ask yourself this question. What side of the sentence is your life depicted by? What side of that period depicts more of the story of your life? I mean, are you on this side of the period where your life story is more about the things being taken from you, about things being robbed from you, about things being destroyed, relationships and ministry and calling and just, or, or, or is your life depicted by the other side of the sentence? Are you, can you say the story of your life is a rich life, satisfying life, a full life, an abundant life? Can Look, if you find your story on this side of the sentence, can I tell you something? You've been deceived by the devil. That is not God's plan for you, for the enemy to steal, kill, and destroy. God's plan for your life was to have a rich and satisfying life. And the only way that you and I cannot experience this is if we're not aware of the enemy's schemes. Come on, church, somebody say amen. Are you amen to me right now? Are you hearing this, you guys? Are you okay? All right? I'm trying to get you, I'm trying to just, and I really believe that many Christians, we could find ourselves on the other side of this, but I just don't think we're fighting the right battle. I don't even think we're, we're fighting with the right weapons. So look, okay, so what do we do then? What do we do? Satan exists and stuff, and I want to get on the other side of this period. I want to see rich and satisfying. I'm tired of him taking. 
Look, the enemy is robbing from us and destroying things, and we don't even know how it's happening. Oh, I don't know why I'm so broke. I don't know why my marriage. I don't know why my kids. Oh, are you kidding me? The God of this world is leading people astray. Know who your enemy is. So what do we need to do? This first Peter tells us, this is what we need to do. Stay alert, church. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. That's what we need to do. Stay alert. Watch out for you to ignore that the devil exists, the enemy exists, that he's leading. He is actively leading the world astray right now will just mean you're going to be deceived. Now, again, don't fall in the other, don't fall in extremes, but be alert. Watch out. Be aware of his scheme. So how do we do that then? That's the question now. Like, how do we, how do, how do I become aware of his schemes? How do I combat the enemy? How do, I, how do I get on the other side of that? How do we defend ourselves against these deceptions through Satan's disguises and, and devastating our life? Or, or let me say it this way. What are the weapons that God has given us to engage in this battle, in warfare? The weapons that are not of the world, the weapons that demolish deception, that tear down lies, the strongholds. What are what are those weapons that God has given us? I think that one of the best description of the weapons of God that he has given us to engage in spiritual warfare uh, against the deception of the enemy is, is in Ephesians chapter 6. Let me go there in your notes with you guys. Ephesians chapter 6, starting at verse 11, says, Put on all of God's armor. So that, and I underline that up here so that you can see the reason why you are to put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against all strate strategies. Methodea in the Greek, it means schemes, tactics, strategies. This is all, so you can stand against the schemes of the devil. In this series, what we're gonna do is not only expose the lies of the enemy, the, de the beautiful deception but, I, but we're going to actually be studying the armor of God over the next three weeks together. Because it is the armor of God is the weapons of warfare that God has given you to stand firm and strong against the schemes and strategies and deception of the devil. That is your weapon. And I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about the armor of God. And therefore, we don't use it properly. We don't wear it properly. We don't put it on properly. And therefore, we're not fighting the battle with the right weapons that God has given us. So we got to put on the full armor of God to stand against the strategies of the enemy. You know, the enemy is, he is cunning and deceiving. If I could picture it in like an, an analogy, anyone like fishing, fishing here? There, we've got some fishermen. I hate it. I'm just going to be honest with you guys. I love, I mean, I've been a few times and stuff, but I'm just not patient enough for it. I'm sorry. I go, go, go. And I'm, I'm more of a, Anyway, so I've gone, though, but I do know this. There's certain kinds of bait for certain kinds of fish, right? Okay, check it out. Listen, the, this, is, this really depicts how the enemy disguises his appearance and his traps and his schemes because, because you put some bait on the end of that hook that is so it is custom made for that fish, all right? And the enemy has a specific bait for every one of our lives. He's got a specific plan and a scheme for you. And then in the fish, they're in the water and they just, all they see is food. Oh, that looks, that looks like it's good for food. Pleasing to the eye, like Eve said. And oh, let me get some of that. And, and so we swim in after some of the bait, the scheme, the trap, not knowing. And then that fish, he takes a bite, a little bite of that hook. And, and for a moment, it's so satisfying. Hits his taste buds. Oh, that's good. I got what I wanted. Oh, it's delicious. But it's followed really quickly by the taste of blood, by the sting of a hook. See, and a lot, and a lot of you, you, you know, you know the taste of blood all too well. That thing that we tasted at first, I mean, it, it had a lot of promise. It was supposed to be good. It looked good. It felt right. I mean, it was but it did not fulfill. Like it was, it's not even good anymore. Now I can't even, sw I don't go where I want to go. I'm followed by this. I'm trapped. I'm led astray now by this deception. I was deceived and now I'm hooked and I can't even go where I want to go now. I'm just, I'm pulled along and led astray by the trap of the enemy. The Bible says that you don't, that the only way that we are to 
the only way that we can fight this enemy, the only way that we can, we can be aware of these schemes is by putting on the full armor of God to armor yourself. And can I say just kind of as a little side note, suit up in the morning, not at night. I'm just, you know, I mean, have a nighttime devotion, that's fine. But I just, I, what I've seen is that a lot of people, they, they get up and, and, and they rush through their day getting ready and they go out to work and they handle their problems, their situations, their circumstances, make decisions, and then they come home and then you read your Bible, you, you do your devotion, you suit up in your armor, and then you go lay down in bed in your armor and go to bed. Come on, man. You got to suit up for the, the battle. The, he's the God of this world, okay? So before you go into that world, what you need to do is suit up. Get on the full armor of God. Wake up 30 minutes earlier just to spend some time with Jesus. Wake up a few, just 30 minutes earlier, spend some time with Jesus in your word, in devotion, in worship. Don't wait for Sunday. Turn some worship on and glorify God somewhere before you go into your day. Suit up. This is what the Bible says. It continues in Ephesians chapter 6. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. There's another tactic. The devil would love for you to believe he doesn't exist or he's abstract or he's not involved in your life because he wants you fighting your boss. He wants you fighting your wife. He wants you fighting your husband. Continue to fight those flesh and blood enemies. Fine. He'll continue to rob and steal and destroy from your life because those are not the enemy. Your enemy is not flesh and blood, but against the evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. That's why we walk by faith and not by sight against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece. And you see, every piece of the armor that I'm going to share with you, I'm going to give you a couple each week. Actually, are the answers to each of these deceptions. I'm sharing, I'll am sharing. i be sharing with you every week. The armor answers the, the deception, every piece of God's armor, so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. So you need to put it on first for when the battle comes. Then after the battle, you will be able to stand firm. How many of you want to be able to stand firm in this life? Amen? against the schemes of the enemy. I mean, aren't you tired of the enemy ravaging and taking and stealing and killing and destroying when God promised you more, when God promised you better, when he promised you rich, satisfying, full, and abundant? It's yours in Jesus' name. It is yours in Jesus' name. You just need to be aware of the enemy and his schemes. Okay, so let me give you a couple pieces of the armor today couple of the first two that we're going to study, write it down this way. Let me give it to you first, that we need to put on truth. Put on truth. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. All right? Jesus is truth. And, and he also says that, that, that the word is truth, that you need to know Jesus. You need to put on Jesus. You put on the truth. Ephesians chapter 6, 14 says, stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth. Okay? Now, this is a... Uh, the picture here is like a Roman soldier, something the Ephesian church would be familiar with. The belt in the armor of the, of the Roman soldier actually held all the pieces together. Without the belt of truth, nothing, nothing fit together. Everything falls apart. So, so listen, you guys, once one lie gets into a believer's life, once you buy in, once you bite, one deception loosens the, the belt, every piece of armor falls off. So this, this, look, putting on truth, that's why it's important to walk in integrity and to have character. You know what? The, the belt also holds the, it's, it, it actually holds the sword. We're going to study that in, a coming, in the coming weeks. But the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Listen, if you're not practicing the truth, you can't wield the word of truth. It, listen, if you're not practicing truth, it doesn't matter how much of the Bible you know, how much of the Bible you can quote. That word of truth has no effect in your life if you're not practicing the truth. You got to put on truth, man of God, woman of God. We need to put on truth, the Bible says. And it's, it's, it's integrity. It's a clear conscience. You know, when you're walking in integrity and you have a clear conscience, you, you can approach the enemy without fear. You have nothing to fear when you... So how do you put it on? A couple things. How do you put it on? Number one, you need to know the truth. Know the truth. John 8 says... Jesus said to the people who believe in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teaching and you will know the truth and the truth is what will set you free. That truth sets free. So you gotta know it. You gotta know your word. You gotta know Jesus. You gotta know truth in order to put on truth. A lie will hold you hostage, but a truth will set you free. 
Amen, somebody? Amen. You have to know the truth. Not only do we know the truth, but we must write this down. we got to speak the truth. You have to align what you're saying with what you're believing, okay? And I'm not talking about the kind of the truth when your wife comes to you and says, do I look fat in this? That's not the kind of truth I'm talking about, okay? Because there's a place for that kind of that kind of truth. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> okay. No, no. Because I've heard some people say, they've said things like, well, pastor, I- I'm an alcoholic and I'll always be an alcoholic. Well, I haven't touched alcohol in five years, but I'm an alcoholic. I heard someone say, I'm an, I'm an anxious person. I will always be an anxious person. I, I, I am. That's who I am. That's part of my identity. That's what my, and, I, and I challenged this person on that. And I said, where did you hear that from? Christian person speaking this. My counselor told me. I've been going to a counselor for five years. He said, that's who I am. I'm an anxious person. That's how I'm built. That's how I'm wired. Listen. Look, you not only have to know the truth, but you need to be able to speak the truth as well. Uh, not, of, not what the God of this world is saying. Not what you're even feeling or experiencing or seeing. Sometimes you got to speak the truth even before it is a real truth in your life. You got to align your words with what the word of God says. To put on truth is not only to know it, but you need to speak it before it ever is. Amen? Amen. Speak the truth. James 3 actually talks about this, the power of your words. He likens it to like the bit in a horse's mouth or a rudder, he says, in a huge ship that in the hands of a skilled pilot, captain, can set the course even against the strongest in the face of the strongest winds, he says. In the same way, a word out of your mouth may seem of no account. It may seem like it's nothing, just easy to rattle off, but it can do two things, one of two things. It can either accomplish nearly anything or destroy it. That's the power of your words. Make sure your words that you're saying, that you're speaking, are aligning with the word of truth, with what Jesus says about you. Amen, somebody? And the more truth you discover, the greater your faith will become. We need to be truth discoverers, truth tellers. Speak the truth, church. Here's the, leads us to our next piece of armor. So put on truth, the next piece of armor. We need to put on righteousness. Put on righteousness righteousness. He continues in Ephesians 6, 14, stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor, or or one translation says the breastplate of God's righteousness. And righteousness means this to being morally right or justified. And the breastplate covered, it covered your heart, all the vital organs, so your heart, your lungs, all the vital organs, the breastplate protected that area. Now, let me give you a few theological terms here to kind of talk about that, this righteousness, this word righteous, because some people have some misunderstanding about what it means to be righteous. There are two different types of righteousness, okay? There is positional righteousness, that's a theological term, positional righteousness, and there is practical righteousness, all right, both are important. Positional righteousness means you, it's your position in Christ is righteousness. Is you, it's not based on what, who you are, or what you've done or have done. It's, it's your position in Christ based on what he has done. That's why we can put it on. We put on righteousness because we put on what Jesus has done for us. And that protects our heart. It protects, all the, it protects our life. But our positional righteousness in Christ Without practical righteousness, meaning the daily living, the daily choices, it gives Satan an opportunity to attack us. When we're not practicing righteousness, when we're not practicing that which we, we believe gives enemy the right and the open door to attack us in our life. Something the breastplate of righteousness does. Here's the first thing. Write it down. It guards your heart. It guards your heart against the deception of the enemy. And that's where he's after. He'll attack you at your heart. Not just your mind, but he's going to go after your identity, your soul, your purpose, to your core. Proverbs 4.23, we're encouraged above all else. Guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. The breastplate of righteousness also does this. It helps us to keep moving forward in confidence. You know, there's no piece of the armor of God that protects your back. All right? God, see, God has given you weapons of warfare, not tools of retreat. He's given you weapons to engage the enemy, not to, not to shrink back. 
All right, the breastplate is a frontal, it's a frontal assault. It protects the front. And, and you know, we even, we quote this verse a lot where Jesus says on this, you know, rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We think about that verse. We think about like how when the enemy comes, we'll be protected because the gates of hell won't prevail against, that's not what Jesus is saying. Listen to what Jesus is saying. The gates of hell will not prevail against you, meaning we're standing at the enemy's gate. We've advanced forward in confidence, not shrinking back, not waiting for the enemy to attack and where he's going to come from. No, no, no. We put on the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, and we march forward into the enemy's territory, and we're taking back everything that he's taken from us. That's what we can do. That's, it's, it's, a, it's a frontal defense, the breastplate of righteousness. First John 3 says, this is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts don't condemn us, we have confidence. Hey, guard your heart. Guard your heart, which leads me to this last one here. The breastplate of righteousness allows us to live free of condemnation. To live free above. God. The Bible says that there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ. You see, the kind of righteousness God wants from us is not a righteousness that we can put on ourselves. It's not your own right action. It's not your own right efforts. The Bible, the Bible want, want, God wants you to put on the righteousness of Christ. And as you clothe yourself in this, in what he has done for you, what he has accomplished for you, by the blood that he shed, by the resurrection, by the power that raised him from the dead, as you put that on, put on his righteousness, I'm telling you, you will walk in his righteousness. You will advance forward, living free of condemnation. Second Corinthians chapter 5 says this. God made him who had no sin, who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. See, we, that's how you can live free of condemnation. That's how you can guard your heart. Because what he has done, not what you have done. Let me end with this, uh, really familiar, John chapter 3, 16. I wanna kinda show you 17 though, verse 17. A lot of people forget about verse 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his own, one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. We know that one, but verse 17 says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Some of you need to know that, okay? God, that's not why Jesus came, and that's not, he didn't come to condemn you. He's not pointing a finger at you. No, he, he came into the world to rescue the world. He came to rescue us. And not only did he come to rescue us, but he said when he actually went to the right hand of the Father where he sits right now, where he's waiting to come back, he said, hey, I'm not leaving you helpless. I'm not leaving you alone. I'm going to give you power. I'm going to give you authority. I'm leaving you with some weapons. You're going to advance in the enemy's territory. You're going to live rich and full and abundant in this life. I didn't come to condemn the world, but to save the world. And maybe you're here today and you fall in, maybe you fall and pray to his schemes because you've been just living oblivious, blinded to the, end, the God of this world. Getting stuff taken from you and robbed for you. Maybe you can't be, your life isn't characterized by the second half of that sentence where Jesus promised rich and satisfying life, full and abundant. And maybe you can see kind of looking back now, right now in the presence of God, just things you can see. How the enemy has operated, not flesh and blood, powers and principalities. Church, it's time to stay alert. Wake up. Because the only way that he's going to continue to take from us, destroy, kill in our life, is if we don't, if we're not aware of his schemes and we're not engaging with the right weapons.